Hello, this is Joshua Gutman, and I'm here with actor, producer, and comedian Pat Oswalt and director and producer Liz Garbus to talk about the upcoming HBO docuseries I'll Be Gone in the Dark, based on the true crime book of the same name written by Michelle McNamara. I'll Be Gone in the Dark chronicles Michelle McNamara's investigation into the Golden State Killer, who terrorized the streets of California from 1974 to 1986. The docuseries balances her investigation with her personal journeys and struggles as a true crime author, while she delves deeper and deeper into the case itself. The series is set to premiere on Sunday, June 28th at 10 p.m. on HBO. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm very good. That's good. Do I sound okay? Yeah, you sound, you sound good. Do I sound okay on my end? Yeah, wow, that's great wallpaper. Thank you, thank you. I've been getting a lot of compliments for it lately. <laughs> yeah, although your your shirt's kind of blending a little bit. It's it's cool. It's almost like you're emerging from the artwork. It's kind of neat. I like that. You know, I was kind of thinking that too, whether it looked like if I was blending in the artwork, but I like your way of looking at it. I am. No, it's no, it's not. It's not that you're blending in. It's that you're emerging out from it. It's kind of cool. I will. I will take that. I will go with that. Kind of like a haunted mansion vibe. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. So where are you calling? Where, where, where are you right now? Um, I'm actually in, I'm in Baltimore right now. I, no kidding. Uh, yeah, I, um, I do live in, I actually do live in Manhattan, but because of everything with the virus, I am staying with family in Baltimore until things are a little bit safer there. Do they live in the city proper or in the suburbs? They live in the they live in the suburbs. They live in the Pikesville area. But I personally used to live in the city. I lived in Fells Point initially. What what years? Um, we moved to well, we moved to Pikesville. I'd say ninety nine or two thousand. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to the city. I'd say 2014, 2015, After I got out of after I got out of college. And yeah, I, I stayed in Fells Point when I was shooting um, Veep. And I remember, I remember Fells Point from the late 80s, early 90s when I was doing comedy there. And then it got so crazy gentrified. Yeah, yeah. It no, was you're nuts. Right. Um, where in Fells Point did you stay? That little, um, what's the one that's Caddy Corner from the Four Seasons, that like extended stay place? Um, the Pen Dream, maybe? No, it was it was a very like corporate kind of bland, generic, hi, but nice. Like, hi, Liz. Hi. Hi, Liz. Sorry oh my either. God! Hi. Hi. Sorry. Oh my God. It's hard doing one's own hair and makeup. Oh God. Oh God. To be on a press tour in COVID. The I'm sacrifices. So, wow. <laughs> Look at Smarty Pants and all her books. Look at that. Ugh. That's a backdrop right there. That is that a is a backdrop, man. It's real life, guys. It's real wow. life. Wow, I love it. Well, I um, most of these are probably my husband's. I don't think I've read most of them. I have probably read one or two. <laughs> I read the one about Nina Simone. I read that. Well, yeah. Um, you had to. But, had to, but I probably didn't read. Let's see, something that maybe Patton read this one. Yes, oh my god. I absolutely read that one and I've um I have all three volumes so far. Simon Callow, great uh, actor by the way from Amadeus and stuff. Mm -hmm. Has become an amazing writer and the, I don't know if you've read those three books. They're fascinating. Liz, no, my husband has, but I'm glad we're impressing you. So. But you yeah. would love you would love those books just because they're so gossipy and amazing and he was such a friggin' lunatic. You should read those. Just, just for sheer you pleasure, would. like I knew you wow, would. what a nutball! Uh, I'll have to give the other books in the series to read. I think I only read the first one back in college. Oh, they're so good, they're so good. Yeah, okay, last... good tip. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, I wanted to thank you both. Thank you both for being here, and I wanted to say for stars just how much I absolutely loved the docu series. You all did a fantastic job. It was very fascinating, and just congratulations, just right, right from there. Oh, thank you. thank you. Yeah, thanks, thank man. You. Yeah, no problem. One of the aspects of the docu-series that I really enjoyed was its ambition. As it did more than just talk about the case, it also talked about Michelle McNamara becoming a true crime writer and the advancement of true crime as a genre. I was wondering what led to that creative decision. 
I'm going to defer to Liz for most of this interview because that sense of depth and epicness and detail came from her mind. I was the guy shoveling all the material her way and she created this amazing three-pronged narrative and I'm gonna shut up now. Liz, go ahead, my God. Well, um, you know, we were channeling Michelle's approach, I think, to crime, you know, which was an approach that was very victim-centered or survivor-centered, you know, centering their stories um, and that, that desire for justice, a lack of sort of fetishization of the perpetrator himself. He's almost irrelevant, well, he's relevant because you want justice, <laughs> but in terms of the sort of fascination with that character kind of devil worship that can happen with serial killers, that was not Michelle's jam. And we, um, and we, I think, followed in those footsteps by exploring deeply the survivor story, by exploring, of course, you know, Michelle was pushed to put her own point of view in the book. Um, we wanted to include her point of view in the in the storytelling as well. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna credit Michelle for that for that approach. <laughs> <laughs> but you did take it to another level in the because she she did that approach writing wise, but you had to figure out a visual and audio scheme to kind of capture the spirit of that book and and roll and adapt with, as you'll see in the documentary, things changing on the ground that were not covered in the book that none of us were ready to deal with. You see how the whole story changes in the narrative. And I remember being with you going, okay, we got to go regroup and figure out how to, I wasn't expecting this development. So again, all of that, getting to watch you um, in action was what a, what a was a was one of the thrills of this documentary geek's life basically so well that's so nice but i will say that um yeah michelle could craft a sentence like um i never could and yes we we did try to bring that level of elegance to our visuals so um we tried and i had an amazing team of collaborators josh and miles and elizabeth and kate so we had we had just an incredible team but Josh, you know, one of the things, like Patton referring to the fact that, of course, we had a big surprise the first day of shooting when we, when there was actually a suspect arrested, but we really wanted the doc to feel like Michelle's journey. I mean, we didn't want to kind of, you know, we wanted to, to go on that journey. If there were folks out there who did not know, you know, that this man was caught, we wanted to have that journey of discovery the way um, the book was written. So we still kind of stuck to that. Yeah. And it's actually kind of funny how you mentioned that because uh, basically, like I know that actually on June 29th, there's going to be another scheduled oh. hearing in the case where they're going to like the motion to compel, the motion to dismissal and demur. Are you guys going to, are you guys going to cover that in any way or look into that? Well, he is going to, he has a plea hearing um, and it has leaked to the media that he is planning on pleading guilty to the charges, which I think is fantastic um, and puts the survivors out of a whole, you know, out of a lot of misery that these, that that court, those trials would be for them. But no, we're not going to cover it. I mean, our story is, is complete. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm very happy for the survivors that they um, could, can get this closure so soon. Yeah. I, I remember when I met with them in Sacramento, one of the things they told me was it, do, it, you, you can't imagine how good it makes us feel to be in court when he's being arraigned and we're staring at him and he cannot meet our gaze. He can't raise his head. He can't bring himself to look at us. That is all of the kind of validation and healing that we need. It was just such an amazing moment. It kind of, I needed a couple of days to recover from meeting them. It was incredible. Were there any stories in particular that really stood out to you when you were listening, when you were talking with the survivors? Uh, Liz was the one who really went deeper into the survivor stories, I think. I, mean, I just met them after a book reading. I yeah. remember the, reading the book. It was more the horror to me that mm. stood out, but Liz. Can you hear? I'm so, I'm so sorry. My son is like screaming at his Xbox down there. Is that coming through, <laughs> Josh? Um, I keep on telling him to be quiet, and he's quiet for two seconds, and it's like, get him out! So sorry if you can if it's distorting the audio. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, oh, Lord. The survivor. Can you hear them? Can you? Oh, hear no, them? no, it's fine. It's okay. I can hear you. Okay. Um, the um, 
the survivor, I mean, you saw, they're amazing. I mean, you saw them like the, you know, it's interesting because, you know, it took us two years to make this. And so for instance, like Chris Pedretti, who we interviewed, who was the young teenager when she was raped by him at 15. Um, you know, she went through like a whole journey in that year and a half from like us being the first people she ever talked to publicly about it to, you know, going out in the courtroom and standing publicly and, you know, demanding justice. Like, like the, that journey, you know, we didn't, it, it, it was incredible. So um, I don't remember your question, Josh, but I think it was about what did we, well, what I was were we most surprised by? Well, I was asking if there were like any like any particular stories um, from mm -hmm. the survivors that you found particularly like either compelling or memorable, maybe even earlier on when in the investigation. Well, I mean, the one that haunts me, and I forget her name, it's the teenage girl who had the fight with her mom and then stormed out and then her mom got killed and she wasn't there. It's almost like she um, survived because what was Debbie Domingo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um and Sherry uh, that, Domingo, yeah. Oh, that really that haunts me. Mm -hmm. So as you were reading through her investigation, was there a particular part of it that you found incredibly fascinating? Oh, this question can be for either of you. I, I doubt, I doubt Pat, Patton probably, you know, he lived it. Um, right. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, go ahead, yeah. Uh, the, the, the part that's the most fascinating to me, um, especially in the book, is that she included in the book pieces of evidence that she chased down that then ran her into a wall. She recreated the moment in, in an investigation when a thing that's looking so good, so good, so good, and then it doesn't pan out and you've wasted weeks. And she really embraces and explores that feeling of like that psychic blow of, I just wasted all this time, which is what investigators go through all the time. And a lot of you know true crime books don't they they cut that out as extraneous. And she was like, no, that's a huge part of this that mm -hmm. disappointment and that anger. So for her to explore that to me was amazing. Yeah, and that's why this book is so much more than you know just true crime. It's about the nature of obsession. It's about the adrenaline of you know feeling like you've gotten close and then the letdown of. Mm -hmm that falling apart, which the investigators also felt, you know, so mm -hmm. I think that all of those aspects made the, the book so, so rich. Um, and you could really feel yourself kind of going through those, you know, knocking on this door, oh, it's a dead end, and then, you know, turning left and going somewhere else. And those can take months and months and months of your life. Mm -hmm. So what was going through both of your minds when Joseph D'Angelo was finally caught and arrested? I kind of wasn't in my mind all that much. I was thinking more because at that point I'd already met so many of the survivors and victims. And so I was thinking of them and I was thinking of Michelle and, and, and also I was thinking of a lot of the investigators. Cause I remember reading about them and wondering how they were feeling and what, you know, thinking of a lot of times when someone's caught, that's when the work begins anew because you want to build the best case. So it's for a lot of times, the investigators or for the, for the pursuers that's not a moment of relief that's a moment of now i've got to work twice as hard to make sure mm. this person stays in their cage so mm -hmm. that's what i was thinking of yeah i mean i think i had i was you know i was thinking of Patton and billy and paul who had worked so hard on this book and um you know and part of and i was thinking of probably how, how bittersweet, I mean, how painful it was, obviously joyous to have an answer to the question, but how painful it was to not have Michelle there to be part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and yes, relief for the survivors. I mean, I think that, um, you know, so interesting. I think if you're just a lay person looking at this case and this guy stopped, you think, oh, he must be dead. But so many of these guys were so convinced he was still alive. Mm -hmm. And I doubt, I didn't, totally didn't believe them. I was like, no way he's still alive. But these guys were sure. And Michelle was sure too. And a lot, some of the invest, and it was really incredible. And I think it's probably grat gratifying for the, vic for the victims that he, they get to see justice done um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, that guy dying, having gotten away with it. So. Mm -hmm. Right.
So I understand that there will be an HBO companion podcast for I'll Be Gone the Dark, hosted by Nancy Miller, Michelle McNamara's editor at LA Magazine, on her piece In the Footsteps of a Killer. Can you go into what will be expanded on the podcast? I I think we're just talking more about the the process of writing the book and how that came to be. And and, um, it's it's focused much more on Michelle and her writing process and what people remember about that, I think. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I know there's a bunch of different episodes capturing different angles. I think, you know, for the one that I'm more in, it's probably more about process. And of course, Patton is there and, and you know, the, the survivors also have so much more story. <laughs> you know, we made a six hour documentary, but, you know, of course, there's so much more that's happened, especially since he's been in the criminal justice system. So hopefully we're also bringing it up to date a bit. Mm-hmm. on what's been happening and how the survivors are dealing with these changes, with these legal changes. So I think there's a lot new there for people to explore. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm sure that especially like as this case moves forward, like it'll be a great opportunity to go into like not only the cha- not only the changings in terms of legal procedure, but how the case moves forward. Yeah, and I was really <laughs> pleased that Nancy Miller was, was the host. I mean, I think she was also your editor, Patton, right? She uh, was, um, well, Nancy Miller was Michelle's editor on her story and she was my editor first for like some short humor thing I wrote and then I recommended Michelle to her and then it became this huge true crime article that they ran. So yeah, she Nancy Miller is such an amazing uh, person in terms of being able to wrangle stuff out of writers. She's incredible. She, yeah, she's tough. And, 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 and also it, it's just lovely that, you know, and then Amy Mann, who's a friend and Michael Penn, who are friends of Patton's, you know, composed our, um, or, or they did the cover of our main title song, yes. Avalanche, um, which is nice. I mean, it feels like they're all kind of extensions of Michelle's world, yes. of Chris Patton's world. But yeah. It, it really, really, yeah, it, it was amazing to be able to pull all these people into it. It's incredible. And honestly, I, it's so happy to see just how amazing a product um, it's <coughs> how series turned out to be with everyone working together. So, yeah. I mean, I bet we have to, we unfortunately have to wrap, but oh. I, want, yeah, but I wanted to say thank you for, <laughs> thank you for your time. And again, congratulations. Um, congratulations for the docuseries. It was, again, absolutely fantastic. And I can't wait for more people to see it. Thanks, man. Thanks, Josh. Hey, stay safe in Baltimore, okay? Oh, you, you both of you also stay safe and keep well. You got it, man. All right. Thanks, Josh. Bye. Bye. Bye.